Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming tonight um, to our program about Curious History. I'm Peggy Vanskoy, and I am the Curious sort of unofficial oral historian. I'm on the board of the Friends of the Page Walker, and I'm also the chairman of the Friends Oral History Program. So you're going to be hearing from two people tonight, me, <laughs> and also um, I'll be introducing her a little later, but we have Ms. J.C. Voss with us tonight. Also, she is the coordinator of collections at the Southern Oral History Program at the Center for the Study of the American South at UNC in Chapel Hill. <laughs> document a community's history. Um, it basically consists of interviewing people who uh, have lived in the community for a long time and who have experienced the, um, the past and are willing to tell us about it. <laughs> we can record those interviews and then keep them for posterity. So um, it's a great way for us to learn about ourselves and our community. And also, we learn a whole lot of things that would never be in a history book. So um, it really enriches our knowledge and understanding of who we are and how we got to where we are today. Um, oral history itself is really not an exact science. It definitely has great benefits um, in telling us about not only local history, but also the cultural history of a community and how our community evolved over time. But it does have limitations as well. Um, the, probably the biggest limitation is that we're all human, and um, memory sometimes isn't strictly accurate, especially the further back you go in time, when you're trying to remember something that happened a long time ago, your facts might not just be right spot on, but that's OK. <laughs> Um, also, people who are telling us their stories also color those stories with their own personal beliefs, the impressions, their attitudes, their prejudices, um, all those things come into play. But actually we can learn something from those too often because it provides us with a, uh, some insight into the thinking and the attitudes and the culture at the time of the story, so we can actually learn from those things as well. So as far as Carrie's oral histories, <laughs> way back when, in the very early 1970s, our very own Ann Kratzer started the Carrie <laughs> Historical Society. And she did that to preserve some um, important documents and papers that were being stored in the basement of Cary High School that were kind of moldering away and she didn't want them to be lost. And once the society got going, it really expanded into saving and preserving a lot of other things too, like buildings and cemeteries and stories and history. And as part of that, the society back in the 70s conducted a few oral history interviews that thankfully we still have and we treasure these very first early interviews. The first one was done um, on January, in January of 1976 with Elva Templeton, who was the daughter of Dr. James Templeton, who was Carrie's country doctor for over 40 years. Um, Ms. Elva was um, a teacher, and she was born right here in Cary, and um, told us all kinds of wonderful stories about very early Cary way back when. Then, in March of 1982, and again in February of 1985, um, two interviews were done with Esther Ivey, who was not born in Cary, 
But she, her family moved to Cary when she was a baby, and she grew up in this house, the Ivy Owington Mottel House, which most of you may recognize. It's on West Chatham Street, right here in downtown Cary. Um, Miss Astor was actually older than Elva. She was born in 1890. Um, and that means that the second interview that they did with her was done when she was 95 years old. Still sharp as a tack. <laughs> so, anyway, she um, was also a teacher early in her life, and then she became a bookkeeper at the Baptist Convention, which spanned a very long career for her. Neither one of these two ladies ever married. There was another woman who sadly we never interviewed, but uh, her name was uh, Irma Ellis. Miss Irma also never married. She lived with her mother and she taught the first grade for more than 40 years in the Cary School. She taught everybody in town. She taught all of their children and many of their grandchildren <laughs> over that period of time. And the reason I'm mentioning her along with the other two is that these three women were adults in the very early part of the 20th century and they had never married. But instead of them being looked down on as being old maid spinsters who had nothing to contribute to society, the absolute reverse was true. Everyone that we have ever interviewed who knew any or all of these three ladies only talk about them with great reverence as having contributed tremendously to our community. And I think that is a great example of what oral history can expose about a community, the attitudes, and the culture in a time gone by that we would have never known any other way. And I just, um, I just love that. I just love the fact that they were all three just thought of so well in our community. So anyway, um, back to the Curie Historical Society. Um, over time, the society began to focus more and more of its efforts on saving one building, this one. And so, at some point, um, it was decided that they really should change the name to more accurately um, represent what they were doing. And so, uh, the name changed to the Friends of the Page Walker Hotel, and that is exactly what it is today. And there is a board of directors. <laughs> Um, with the Friends, which I joined in 1997. And then in 1998, um, the board proposed that we start an oral history program to try to learn more and capture more of our history. And I volunteered to chair the program because I had been trained in oral history in California before I moved here, and I had experience. And plus, I love doing it, so I volunteered. And we began to put together a plan for what to do, what, what our mission would be, what we hope to learn and accomplish. We started to put a list together of people to interview. And then we had to ask ourselves the question of, well, once we have interviews, how are we going to preserve them? What are we going to do with them? We need to uh, make sure that they survive. And so we did research, and we found the Wilson Library at UNC Chapel Hill, <laughs> um, where, which is, and was then, and continues to be, a repository for oral history interviews as part of the Southern Oral History Program. And that they would welcome all of our interviews and make them available to scholars and academia for um, any research that might be going on. Well, that was perfect. That's exactly what we wanted. So we had that all lined up. So we now were ready to go, and our first interview that we did uh, was conducted in October of 1998 with a man named Warren Williams. The Williams family owned and lived right here in the Page Walker Hotel from 1939 until 1971. So we thought that was a really good place to start. Anyway, and we went from there. <laughs> um, the method that we used 
to um, record interviews, we uh, began recording on cassette tapes. And then, once the interview is completed, then the interviews were transcribed, typed out into a um, written format. And we continued with that method um, until we had completed 60 interviews between 1998 and 2010. We had 60 of them by that time. And in 2010, we finally stepped up to more modern technology and began to digitally record our interviews and then continue to transcribe them. We did, we, so far to date, we have completed 25 more interviews done by that method. And then this year, because it's our 30th anniversary, the original cassette recordings were converted to a digital format and, um, and so those are now all digital. And the friends created our own cloud on our website. And um, we deposited all of them in our cloud. And here's what's wonderful. Whoops, there it is. You can listen to every one of our interviews if you are interested. And here's how you do it. So, so that my pointer will work a little bit. Okay, so you go to our website right here, thefriendsofthepagewalker.org. You will get a screen, and you scroll down the screen until you find this old time looking radio. Click on that. You'll get another screen. Scroll down that screen until you see a list that looks like this. This is all of our different interviews. And there are these little icons right here. The speaker icons are the recorded voices. And um, if, there are, if there's more than one, that means there's more than one file for the interview. So you would listen to the first one, and when that finishes, you would go to the second one to fit here the rest of the interview. If there's only one, the whole thing is on one file. The paper, the page-looking icon, is the written transcript, so you can pull that up and read it as well. The list is in alphabetical order, by last name, and you can also see on the list <coughs> when the interview was completed. So um, if you're adventurous, you can go in and listen. And what's really wonderful about listening to the actual interviews is that over the last 17 years that we've been doing these, um, we've lost a lot of those narrators. They're gone now. So. Um, but we have their voices, which is just great. So, going back to the late 1980s, and, or 90s and, and 2000, we had interviews. This is great. We started saying, okay, what are we going to do with them? We've got all these great stories you know, that we've been hearing, and we want to get them out to the public. How can we do that? Well, we came up with several ways. First of all, um, at the time, about 2000, the Cary Historical Museum was being created on the third floor of this building. And because we now had some interviews, we decided, they decided, to um, create something called a listening station, where um, excerpts from 10 different interviews were put onto this listening station, and you could, when you visited the museum, you could hear some of those stories in the person's voice. And that worked beautifully, and it, it was um, used a lot by many, many visitors. Sadly, this year it broke. <laughs> but for 14 years, it was a real great thing. <laughs> anyway, um, so we did that. Then, as we were getting more and more interviews completed, it just made sense to me that these interviews could be put into a book. And so I started to um, compile them into a book, and I published the first one in 2006, called Just a Horse Stop in Place. This book is full of these great stories from the oral histories, telling about Kerry in a bygone era um, of the people, the places, the events, how the town grew, um, just all kinds of fun stories and facts in that book. Then in 2008, 
2007, the Cary News invited me to have a monthly column under the <coughs> heading of Cary's Heritage, and all of those columns come from the oral histories, which is a great way to get this out to the public. And the column that just came out last week, the October column, was our 106th so far. I'm hoping the Cary News is still around for a very long time, and they'll let me keep sending the <coughs> columns because it's such a great vehicle for us to do this. Um, as I was putting together this first book and we were doing more interviews, I started to notice that a lot of the interviews we were doing were focused on a much more serious history. Um, it was national history that took place right here in Cary in kind of a big way, even though Cary wasn't very big at the time. And so I began to focus on that and compile all of those, those interviews into a second book, which I published in 2010. <coughs> this book is, um, tells the story of the civil rights movement in Cary. So um, Cary became a leader in desegregating the schools um, in the 60s, not only for Wake County, but for the whole state, and in some of the other communities even throughout the South. This book tells that story, but it also tells the story of the black community from before, during, and after civil rights. And it is just full of the most inspiring stories you'll ever read. So, um, the ballad came out in 2010. And then, in 2013, um, a little booklet was put together called Carry Through the Years. This is a historic timeline about Carrie's history from the very earliest white European settlers through 2013. It's full of all kinds of really interesting facts and great pictures from, you know, throughout all this, this timeline. And um, so that has been completed, and many of those facts came from our oral histories as well. So um, all three of these publications are available for sale, and if anybody's interested in one or all three, you can um, see Ms. Lisa um, over here in the corner after the program tonight. And finally, uh, we continue to explore ways to get our stories out to the public um, in the future. And one of the ideas that's in its infancy, but we are beginning to really explore and work on a much expanded, technologically up-to-date replacement for the listening station. Um, when that will be completed, where it might be, don't know yet, but it's something for us all to look forward to. So um, we're excited about the possibilities of that. So, um, we have now completed 85 interviews so far, and we continue to do more all the time, so we're not done by any means. But what have we learned? Well, um, these are just some of the people who have told us what we have learned. And um, the, the bedrock of the knowledge that we have gained is Carrie's growth. Everything is kind of built on growth. Um, these stories start from before the Civil War. They go all the way through this, from this small southern agricultural town all the way to the high-tech center that we are today. Um, it, they, it covers the life and evolution of the town, um, not only of Cary, but also Morrisville, Carpenter, Green Level, Swift Creek, Apex, we touch on Holly Springs, Durham, and Raleigh. So the triangle, the carry is clearly the nucleus of all of this history and, and, the, and the different stories. So, and they, they go from the small agriculture and timber town to when the railroads came into the town and had a huge impact to when education became the very heart of Cary um, and still is with that first school at the head of Academy Street and beyond. How Cary then became the bedroom community for RTP as it was being developed and growing. 
And then how Cary began to attract its own industry outside of RTP to stand on our own to what we are today and where we're going in the future. And all of that created that incredible growth. So, um, is that it? Wait, no more. There we go. Um, so, out of all of this, we have learned a tremendous amount about what we have gained, but we have also learned something about what we have lost over time as well. So, um, anyway, so and I'm going to now turn this over to Ms. JC to tell us what happened to our interviews that we trucked out there first in cassette form and then digitally and whatever out to the Wilson Library and what happened to them from there. So, I'm not the coordinator of collections at the SHP. Um, so I came to Chapel Hill originally in 2011. I'm from Iowa, um, a native Iowan. Um, but I came to UNC to get my Master's in Library Science in 2011. And that's when I started to work as an archival processor for the Southern Oral History Program. Um, so it was sort of a crash course in oral history, but I quickly realized how much I loved listening to all these different Southern voices. And I really enjoyed doing all the work to preserve and share oral histories with wide audiences. Um, so after I graduated about two years ago, um, I began working for the SOHP full time. Um, and our work just gets more and more rich and interesting every week. Um, and I wanted to give you some background about the Southern Oral History Program, just to get an idea of um, its history and its mission, how it's changed over time, and where we are now. Um, so the SOHP was founded in 1973 at UNC by Jacqueline Dow Hall, who um, at the time had just finished her PhD in history at Columbia University, and she was beginning her career as a professor and historian. Um, Jacqueline was a young activist herself. She was really active in the women's movement and the civil rights movement in Atlanta. Um, and she came to UNC wanting to do something that, at the time, no other oral history programs were doing. She wanted to not only interview the movers and the shakers and the people that were in power, um, in history. She also wanted to interview ordinary people from all walks of life. So much of the history, much history was and still is written by and for those in power, um, but that doesn't always give the whole picture and it certainly doesn't always give a lot of space for individuals or communities who have their own alternate narratives and stories to tell. So in founding the SOHP, Jacqueline and others at UNC really did something groundbreaking in bringing these marginalized voices um, of working class individuals, of women, um, of people of different, uh, different minorities, into the archive and into historical scholarship. Um, so since 1973, over the past four decades, the SOHP has conducted research projects and worked with community partners to explore the history and culture of the American South by talking to its people. Um, so this includes activists, politicians, educators, laborers, business leaders, students, um, all different types of people. And so now we have an archive of nearly 6,000 oral histories, and the majority of which are available for anyone around the globe to access in digital form in our online database through the Southern Historical Collection at Wilson Library. Um, so we've expanded over the past four decades in exciting and unpredictable ways, but our core mission hasn't changed. Um, so research, teaching, and community engagement remain the foundation. Um, and then I have a short video clip that I want to play um, where Jacqueline's sort of explaining how these three things work together. From the very beginning, the oral history program has had at least three broad missions. It's had the mission of going out and interviewing people and doing the hard work of making those interviews part of an archive, working with people to make them available to historians and other people to use and read and learn from and write history from. We've also had the mission of engaging undergraduate students and graduate students in learning to use interviews in their own work and in their own in their own creative work and creative work of all kinds not just writing dissertations and writing books but making documentary films and uh, creating performances and so on thirdly 
we've had the mission of um, going beyond the university to help people in local communities learn to do and to do uh, oral history themselves. I think we can say that we have played a really important role in moving oral history from the margins to the center of scholarly writing and research. Um, so like you heard from Jacqueline, research and scholarship is a huge component of the oral history program's mission. Um, and so I want to highlight just a few of the big research areas and projects over the past 40 years. So in 1987, um, they published a book called Like a Family, The Making of a Southern Cotton Mill World, which takes a really deep look at the textile industry in North Carolina and on labor and industrialization in the American South more broadly. Um, this book drew on hundreds of interviews conducted by the SOHP in the 1970s and 80s, and today is considered a classic text in Southern working class history. In the 1990s, the SOHP took on um, the ambitious Listening for a Change project in which program faculty, staff, and community collaborators sought to record oral history interviews in every county in North Carolina, creating a vibrant archive of the state's diverse and rapidly changing populations. These interviews focused on recent history and current social change, and among other things, this project led to the publication of a new textbook on North Carolina history. In the early 2000s, the SOHP took on, um, undertook another massive project that has resulted so far in over 1,000 interviews about the idea of a long civil rights movement. Um, so in this research, uh, we examined civil rights efforts across a lot of different movements and communities, like environmental activism, uh, women's rights, school desegregation, and labor struggles from the 1960s onwards. So we see how all these things are connected and how um, they're still relevant today. Currently, we're working on a project called New Roots, which is conducted in collaboration with the Latino Migration Project and UNC Libraries to gather interviews about Latino migration to North Carolina and the formation of Latino communities. Uh, for this project, we're building a bilingual archive where these interviews will be available in both English and Spanish in order to provide access to a broader global audience so the people who are being interviewed um, they often are coming from Mexico and places in South America. So by having this bilingual archive, um, their families back home and their communities back home can actually access the interviews as well. So um, this really just gives you a taste of all the research that the SOHP has conducted. Um, and other interviews have been the foundation of dozens of scholarly articles, books, theses and dissertations, documentaries, radio broadcasts, and digital humanities projects about countless aspects of the American South. Um, so briefly, I also want to talk about the teaching aspect of the SOHP's mission. Um, since, it, since it was founded, um, the program has always taught a graduate seminar every spring about oral history methodology, and this usually draws students from across disciplines like history, anthropology, religion, folklore, English, um, and among many others. Um, so in this class, students conduct interviews, and they work in collaboration with their interviewees and with each other to create historical evidence and contribute to the SOHP's archive. Um, so we also, every semester, hire three or four graduate students who serve as um, field scholars, and they're the ones who actually go out and conduct a significant number of interviews every semester um, to go into the archive. And starting in 2012, we've also been doing this undergraduate internship program um, where undergrads get really hands-on experience doing interviews. Um, they also participate in a weekly seminar. Um, they work with us at the office doing a lot of different tasks. And they run their own research projects, so it's a really great hands-on experience for both graduate and undergraduate students at UNC. Um, so there are some other campus-wide collaborations with faculty and students who want to conduct interviews in their classes or who want to use the material from our archive as a major part of their course research. Um, so we have collaborators in the med school, we have collaborators in English and folklore, um, really across a wide variety of disciplines. Um, so we help these faculty and students plan the, the oral history assignment that might be in their class. Um, we often give them workshops about conducting interviews and using the archive. Um, and we typically add these interviews that they conduct in their classes to our archive as well. So it's, it's already growing because of these different collaborations. Um, and in a similar way, we also work with various community organizations and outside researchers throughout the South. And this community engagement 
is the third big part of the SOHP's mission. Um, so I'm especially grateful that the SOHP has worked with so many different community groups over time for a number of reasons. Um, the SOHP alone doesn't always have the resources, um, whether that, that's time or financial or intellectual or just a matter of personnel, to do these really in-depth research projects with all the different vibrant communities throughout North Carolina that need to be documented. So it's really important for us as a program to work with these different groups and to partner up with people who are passionate about local history and who can devote the time and other resources to collect and capture these stories and perspectives from their own communities before they're lost. Um, so there's a lot of big advantages to doing this sort of partner-based oral history project um, where the community members themselves have a deep level of knowledge and expertise about their own community and its history, its traditions, its social functions and values and memories um, that outsiders like me might not always know about because I'm not part of that community. Um, and so having this insider perspective is really useful in conducting oral history interviews because it makes the people who are being interviewed feel a lot more comfortable. Um, they're more willing to open up because there's already a sense of trust and of belonging um, because the person interviewing them understands that they're part of their community. Um, and so in doing these projects with community members as opposed to people like me who are from UNC and are outside of the community, the interviewers um, can establish a more comfortable setting where the interviewees feel free to share everything. Um, and the, the interviewers typically come with a deeper sense of knowledge where they can ask better questions and they know to follow up on things that I might not know, um, I just might not know to follow up on. So um, because of these things, and it's also really empowering for community groups to take this history and really document it um, with their own hands and, and their own voices. Um, and again, this illuminates the many perspectives of our varied communities that are often left out of the history books. Um, so, of course, when we work with community partners who are conducting their own oral history projects, then we take all the necessary steps to add these interviews to our archive um, at UNC and then um, we make them accessible through our online database. So, our partnership with uh, the Friends of the Page Walker Hotel to document the history of Cary is one example um, that has and continues to be a really great success. Um, this partnership dates back for many years. Um, long before I came to the oral history program, but I have been really, really lucky and I'm really grateful to continue this important work, um, I'm taking this right from the mission, I think, um, to document the history of Cary by recording observations which relate to the character and development of the town. And of course, I owe a special thanks to Peggy, um, who I've worked with for about um, a year now, um, to continue this partnership and to make these rich oral histories part of the SOHP's archives. Peggy and others with the Friends of the Page Walker Hotel have conducted interviews, um, like, she's, like she's mentioned, um, with prominent families from Cary, um, a former mayor, teachers, former sharecropping families, longtime community merchants like restaurant, grocery, and barbershop owners, um, the town's retired chief of police and fire chief, and the former Page Walker Hotel owners. Um, these, do these dozens of interviews are part of our archive, and I have a couple of clips that I wanted to, to play for you all. Um, just so you can sort of actually hear some of these voices. Um, so the first one is with Carl A. Mills, Jr. It's from June 3rd, 1999, um, and he was a principal um, in Cary at the time of integration. Can we go back for a minute and talk okay. about when you were principal? Um, I'd like to talk a little bit more about integration, if I could. Okay. Um, while you were principal, um, you had a student, the first male black student, come into your school, Douglas Pennington. Yes. Could you talk about that a little bit and how that went? That was the most amazing uh, situation. Even though I, on a non-paid ba basis, I was at the school all summer enrolling kids, I could still expect half the auditorium be filled with new kids <laughs> on the first day. So uh, this black youngster came in without his parents. So uh, I said, this is going to be interesting. But I've got something like 200 kids to put in classes <laughs> in the auditorium. So. Uh, I turned him over to a teacher that 
uh, I knew she could handle the situation. What the... What happened? It was noon before I got back to see what what had happened with the youngster. And he had those kids entertained. He was telling jokes. He was he had these Caucasian kids just eating out of his out of his hands. Mr. Mr. Mills died two weeks after that. Wow. Were we lucky to get Mr. Mills? Can you understand it better online? Yeah, I think it's just the speakers on that computer. <coughs> but he's basically talking about how this young student came to the school and he was really worried and he had to like leave him alone with another teacher and he's like, oh, what are, you know, what's going to happen when I'm gone? And when he came back into the room, um, the black student was like entertaining all the other students and they were just like, he says like they were just eating out of the palm of his hand. Um, he just made friends really quickly and then he ended up being inducted in the Junior Beta Club, um, which I think is sort of like the National Honor Society. So he, um, like at the beginning of that clip he says, you know, this was such an amazing experience because this student was the, the very first person um, to, to integrate the school and he, you know, he thrived in Perry, um, which, you know, certainly wasn't the case throughout the South. What was that year? Um, the year of the interview or of the... Integration. Was that no, I think I think he came into Cary Elementary School either 1964 or 65. It was pretty early, actually. Yeah. Um, the other clip I was going to play is with um, Wendell Matthews, and I'll just tell you what she says in it. Um, so it's from December 1999, and she's basically talking about how um, she, as an African American woman, observed. Um, segregation in Cary and Raleigh, and so she's saying that the downtown um, has changed a lot, but that she really felt like um, there was more sort of discrimination happening in Raleigh than there was in Cary, and she, you know, thinks only about going to town in Cary at that time in the 1960s. I knew Cary, and when I was growing up and was going to Cary High, from where Cary High is now to what was then the downtown area, I remember when you know, you've probably heard where blacks lived on one side, on the other side of the railroad tracks. That's when I knew, that's how I knew Carrie to be, was all of my black friends were on the other side of the railroad tracks that run through downtown, or not through the middle of downtown necessarily, but that are right there. All my friends were over there on the other side of town. They were black and across the tracks. And to see Carrie now and how it has grown and how far it has extended its boundaries is just phenomenal. I had a friend who used to live there. Um, Steve and he and I talked together, his name was Stephen Jones, and, and we were just, he lived in like Cary proper, you know, and he was considered old Cary, you know, because he was an originally, originally from Cary, he'd always attended Cary schools, um, and so his, his family had lived there, and that's where he grew up, and so he was always amazed also at what was happening to Cary. Um, and so it, it's, it's nothing like what it was then, nothing. It was very, it had a much more rural flavor to it when we were growing up. Not that it was rural in the sense, but it was a small town, it was very small. And so now it is this large place. It's very, very interesting to see the growth of Cary over the years. It's very, I'm not sure that I like it. Um, those who are not from Cary uh, don't have anything to compare it to, so they probably like it. But it's, it was so um, quaint is almost the word when, when I was growing up. And I really liked the care of the town itself. So I thought these were two, um, these are just two examples, but I think they reflect um, a lot of what, what you found. And all of these are available in the online database. And I, since we couldn't really listen to them well very, very well tonight, I can tell you that um, the link to them if you're interested. Um, So the actual process of archiving these interviews and making them available online is um, a pretty lengthy one and fairly complex, but I want to just give you the basic ins and outs um, of, how, of what I do in these important steps. Uh, so today, nearly all interviews are born digital, um, which just means that the audio was recorded digitally on a recorder, probably um, as an MP3 or a WAV file. And then the transcripts are also created digitally, probably in Microsoft Word format. Um, 
So when I get these new oral histories from people like Peggy in this format, it's already fairly easy to put them online and share them through our online database. Um, so I actually get these files, um, so the transcript and the audio and other things, from the interviewers electronically. Sometimes people upload their files onto a cloud storage platform like Dropbox or Google Drive. Um, so all I have to do is access that link and then go into the cloud and download them onto my own uh, computer or server so that I can then start the archival process. Um, sometimes people also mail me their digital files on an external hard drive. Um, or sometimes if they're just in the area, if they're in Chapel Hill, they can just stop over at my office and transfer the files on a flash drive um, right to my computer. So now that everything is pretty much born digital, it's actually really easy to share all these different files. Um, in the past, you know, interviews were recorded on cassettes, and um, starting in about the 80s, they were, there was some word processing technology, so some people had you know, like really nice typewritten transcripts. Um, and of course, they type, you know, from a typewriter before that, and so it, they used to mail things in in hard copies, or they would have to drop off the hard copies um, to to us at the library. Um, so when I actually have all the materials, the next step that I do is um, basically assess everything, make sure that it's squared away with the release forms. Um, we have to double check on all the rights, make sure we have permission to add them to the archive, and we have permission to share them with broad audiences. Um, so I just go through, make sure I'm not missing anything. Um, and so in addition to the audio files and the transcripts, we also collect things like abstracts and field notes. Um, so people take notes as they're doing the interview sometimes, and we, we can collect those. Um, photographs and the release forms. And occasionally people also, um, they'll have like a brochure or something, of, um, a program that they work for, and they want that to be included with the interview. So we can do things like that as well. Um, so at this stage, one important thing here is that I have to make sure I have both the preservation copy and the access copy of the material. Um, so since we want to preserve these things for the long term, we have to make sure we have the original copy of the material in a really safe place where nobody can mess with it. Um, so when this was, you know, like a reel-to-reel -reel tape or a cassette, um, those would just go into the stacks, the original, the original cassettes would go in there. Um, and once the um, once they had the original, they would record <coughs> the a listening copy of the cassette, and then the listening copy would be the thing that you could get from the library, but when the original one would just stay in the stack. So it was used to make that recording, the copy recording just once. Um, but now that everything's digital, it's a lot different. Um, the original material goes into the um, deep storage on the server, and then I just make the access copy of the audio file, um, and that's what goes into the archive um, in the online database. Um, then I organize all the materials and give them file names so that I can find them in the, um, in the online catalog. So I name them according to the project and to um, when they occur so chronologically. And I can always tell from the interview number that I give them um, where they fall in line with the rest of our collection. Um, and then I work with the other archivists over in the library to start <coughs> to, um, processing each interview and adding it to the database. Um, so we use this system called Content DM. Um, it's what UNC libraries as a whole uses for their digital collections. Um, Content DM is powered by OCLC, which is a library consortium, and it's a really common database or content management system for different academic libraries throughout the country. Um, so we're sort of in the same league as, as everyone else when it comes to that. Um, so I just upload the audio and the transcript into the system, and then I fill out this form um, that has all kinds of different information about each interview that basically then becomes the catalog record. So when you're searching in our catalog, sort of like you're doing the library catalog search, um, that's the information that I'm putting in. So there's information about the interview itself, like the date of the interview, um, who conducted it, what, part, what project it's part of. Um, and then I fill out a lot of biographical information about the interviewee. Um, so what they did for their occupation, um, their gender, their ethnicity. Um, just things about them that I know that researchers are interested in searching and browsing the database for. Um, then I add the abstract, which covers all the different topics discussed during the interview, so it's just the contents of the interview. Um, and then I fill out a lot of information about the materials themselves, so like the format of the audio interview, um, how many pages the transcript is, whether or not there's a print copy of the release form, um, or field notes or things like that. 
Um, these are basically things that are important for the librarians to know just for, for future reference as we're making sure that we're preserving these things um, correctly. So that all of this information goes into the online database. Um, this is just sort of a sample of what that looks like. Um, so you can see, you can play the audio file at the, at the top of the screen there. And then as you're listening to the audio, you can scroll down through this middle part, which is the transcript, so you can actually listen to it and, and read it at the same time. And then this information below, that's what I was just talking about with um, the descriptive information about the interviewee and the contents of the interview. Um, so this basically is just like the, the catalog record of every item um, all with this. Um, are the blue words the uh, keywords or those that are major index words? Yeah, so those are things that you can actually click on and then that will take you to similar interviews that, have, that might be part of the same project or, yeah. If you have a photograph, where would it be located? Um, the photograph goes into our digital repository. So it would not be in this. It, it's not exactly in this. Um, we're trying to move to a system where we can do that. Right now, this only supports the transcript and the audio. Um, but eventually, we want it to be where everything is in one place. Yeah, that's a good question. And what is your website to get to this? Um, you can get to it from SOHP.org. Um, and I have it on the, the last slide as well. Um, and then if we have any um, if we have any print or physical materials, that, like if we still have cassettes or print transcripts, um, then we store these up in the stacks in the archive. So they're kept in a climate controlled room um, for long term preservation. And then for all the digital pieces, they go into the Carolina Digital Repository, um, where they're stored on a server that gets um, that gets backed up regularly, so that um, we know that it's going to be there for the long term, and where nobody can actually get in and download it. So it's preserved safely in the CDR there. Um, and so we go through all these different steps because we believe that it's incredibly important to share these stories and histories with researchers and teachers, um, students, community members, family members really anyone who wants to come to this. Um, then I have another I have another short video, and I think the audio is better on that, if we can listen to just that part, that I think really highlights the importance of sharing these um, and making them available. Of course, the reason that, one of the reason we're here is because um, the SOHP interviewed your parents, so I should say for the record, your parents are Lloyd and Gertrude Shooping. Uh -huh. And, um, they are from, what, what did you know about your parents growing up? My dad was born in Statesville, I knew that. And, uh, Gertrude and Lloyd Shooping were mill workers, textile mill workers in the early 20th century. They worked in and around Charlotte and Greensboro. And they were interviewed in the 1970s by the SOHP. Those interviews were enormously important to the SOHP and to the authors of Like a Family. And of course, when Mrs. Lyerly and her family found out this interview existed, this was amazing news to them. They had no idea their parents had ever been interviewed and that there were copies of it. I picked them up, picked up the tape, uh, and uh, started playing it in the car with my sister, oldest sister. And we, we finally just had to stop because I said, can you believe this is mom and dad and we didn't know really anything about it. And to hear their voice, uh, it was unreal. I am so grateful to this organization for that. It has meant everything to us. These interviews, these voices, they're not just important to the Southern Oral History Program and to scholars and researchers. These are voices that have been captured and preserved. These are stories that have so much meaning for families and for communities. And they're preserved for future generations, for family members that came later. And talking with Mrs. Lyerly and getting her thank you card just crystallized it so perfectly. What these voices that the SOHP has collected and preserved, what they mean to people. You knew when you heard the recordings, you knew their voices. Granddaddy Jay had a very distinct voice, so you knew it was them, and it was really very touching to be able to hear their voices in here. And laugh and 
to say. Yeah. Like that laugh. And he could not tell you a joke because he'd get tickled himself. And then you wouldn't understand. <laughs> it was so tickled. He'd get tickled the on the punchline. <laughs>
How pervasive is it across the United States and other regions of the country? It's really mostly just the South. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. a lot of people um, like from New York who then came out of the South, so mm -hmm. you know, some people from like the Midwest who came to the South. Um, you know, just like logistically, most of our interviews actually are from North Carolina, but there's quite a few in South Carolina, Alabama, um, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. um, but with the um, with the current New Roots project with the Latino immigrants, um, some of those some of the people um, are actually interviewed in Mexico. There's um, a class that goes to Mexico every spring during their spring break to do interviews. So we're sort of reaching this idea of um, a global South in that way. Well, I just wondered if other universities across the country oh, are yeah. doing those within their own regions, their mm -hmm. own interviews. If that your program really helps spawn some of that program. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of, like, there's a really great program in Kentucky, and so they, you know, they focus more on Kentucky history, right. and, but okay. California has a couple of really great programs, and um, there's a good one in Wisconsin. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Is, there, um, is there one that you participated in that you really liked, and one that you really hated? What would be an example? <laughs> <laughs> one that really stands out to you that you really liked? I don't know that I hated any. You've done more than me, so you like that. Um, one for me that I really liked, I actually interviewed my old boss, um, <laughs> Beth Millwood, um, and that was, it was really fun because I learned a lot about her that I didn't know, even though I worked really closely with her for several years. So that was a fun way to get to know her more. It was surprising, like I, she had a really amazing, like I've only known her since she's been at USC, but she had this whole life, you know, before. Before you would see so I got to And a family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did, did anyone ever interview her? Yeah. Dean and I contacted her several times and his wife, and they both turned me down every time. Oh, it's just heartbreaking. I know. Oh, I, I don't, it, was so, it was so modest. I really don't have anything to tell you. And I knew that was true. Well, yeah, he just, he was really shy. And it just broke my heart. I did try a number of times. And I thought, well, I'll interview his wife. And she wouldn't do it either. <laughs> do you have any idea what sort of usage or listening that you've been getting from these things? How many bits you get? Uh, one a week? Uh, one a oh, day? yeah, yeah. Um, I don't want to say like anything for sure, but I think it's around at least a dozen a day. Um, probably more. Like we, we have um, Google Analytics as sort of the backup, and that gives us like a monthly report. But it's usually, you know, like the hundreds and hundreds every single one. So, um, and people are listening to this stuff literally all over the globe, you know, people in India and China and all over South America. And, so. If you happen to be a family member, like those ladies at the end, whose parents' voice had been recorded, is there a way to, to capture that or link that somehow to like a record that you might be doing on, like, say, Ancestry.com? Oh, that's a good idea. I've never, I haven't really ever around with Ancestry.com, so I don't know how it works, but um, but you could download the, you can download all this stuff from our website, and so I don't know, you can upload stuff like that into Ancestry. Because can you imagine, you know, for future generations having your actual ancestors' voice talking to you? I have, um, when we were doing cassettes, I have made a copy and given it to um, the family after, like Mr. Mills, for example, I, I gave his wife a copy of his interviews. Um, and, and fairly recently, um, I've given thumb drives uh, of the digital recordings to family members, um, especially if someone passed away right after the interview. It, was, it means a lot to know. But this being available is, is relatively new. In, it for is. Us. It's very new, yes. In fact, we just, um, Bob just uploaded 55 digital. Um, interviews to our cloud just you know, like in August. I mean, that's, that's how new that, that those have been added to our cloud. So yeah, this is very new. Now, you mentioned Google Analytics. Does this mean if I type in a name and I was just searching for information about and they had an interview in your database, it would show up in the Google list? Um, so if you do, if you Google like a person's name and then maybe like SOHP after, oh. it, would, it would open. But not necessarily. 
not necessarily. Google Analytics is like a, a way to track usage on the back end. Right. So it's more telling me like what people are clicking on oh, on the website. Okay. Mm -hmm. But yeah, our, our stuff is all searchable on Google. And if I went into SOHP and I wanted to do Cary High School desegregation, would mm -hmm. the list of interviews that treat yeah. that? Exactly, yeah, because okay. so, that's why I do all, I take all that time to put in yeah. all those keywords. And, right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Looks like it's got a good <laughs> well, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you.